Hello everybody. I think that was a very quick introduction. I normally have a couple more minutes to ease into myself. Uh, welcome to this evening's Thinking. I am Liz Mosley. I'm editor and partner here at Tortoise Media. And um, for those of you who haven't been to a Thinking before, um, this is called a Forum for Civilised Disagreement. It's a sort of an editorial meeting really. Um, and it's a core part of what we do at Tortoise. We're trying to be an open newsroom where we sort of convene conversations to try and thrash out what ultimately is a sort of editorial point of view on a question. And we do them on loads and loads of different topics, um, some serious, some silly, some more difficult than others. And this question this evening um, is a very important question, self-evidently, and it's also quite a challenging one um, to talk about. Um, we are wanting to try and have a balanced and productive conversation. Um, and of all the thinkings we've done since lockdown, when we flipped and went digital, this is the one that I most wish we were able to do um, physically in person um, together. As the editor tonight, it's my job to try and make sure we have a fair conversation, to give everybody the opportunity to um, air their point of view. Um, and there's sort of a couple of things to note about how this is going to work. The chat, um, everybody knows how to use Zoom now, but the chat is open. You can type what you want in there. My colleague, um, Mark and Selena are sort of there um, monitoring the chat and sort of helping people. Um, there he's doing his little yellow hand wave. Um, you can private message if you want to. Um, and if you want to join in, because the whole point of today is that people get to have a say, then type your kind of thoughts and uh, uh, edited version in the chat, and I will bring people in as we go along. Um, all that said, um, I should declare an interest. I am a lesbian, and so I have some skin in this game. Um, and I know that we are trying to tackle a really big topic, but we do only have an hour. Um, and it's not a thinking that's going to last till Christmas. So the, I'm going to try and stay as focused to the question as I can, um, which is really about kind of what happens to mature campaigning organisations who find themselves, for whatever reason, disconnecting from and being criticised by some of their core uh, supporter base. But how that happens, what can or can be done about it, what happens to those people who uh, might feel that they are getting left behind. Um, I am also very nervous about this thinking um, as a sort of um, semi uh, trigger warning. We, we, we had a thinking earlier this year uh, about the Tavistock and um, we felt like we did quite a good job of having a calm and respectful conversation. Um, and we received lots of really lovely feedback afterwards from all kinds of people who were in the room. Um, but we also um, had some really really negative feedback afterwards too so all the same people had the same experience and some people felt very negatively and some people felt very positively so it could be one of those um this evening um so i hope i can do an okay job of it i'm going to give it a, a go and to get us up and running let's start with a um a relatively easy question um, i'm going to pose it if i can to jan jan gooding who's former chair of stonewall and you're a trustee at the moment of the um, organisation, aren't you, Dan? No. So, so tell me your your um, your current level of involvement with Stonewall. No, I I stepped down as chair um, last April, and I stepped down as a trustee last October. Okay, so you're not officially affiliated to it at, at the moment. No. Okay, cool. Um, so let's just start with a relatively easy question, which is just to do a sort of mini recap if you like on um stonewall the kind of few sentence version of what it is for why it exists what it campaigns for well stonewall just had its 32nd uh birthday and when i joined as a trustee it was coming up to around its 25th anniversary and for that first period that first quarter century it was a, a an lgb uh, campaigning charity and equality organization and at around that time um, where, as we look forward to our strategy going ahead having achieved a huge amount of legislative change as I'm sure everyone is is well versed we were developing as an organization and we found that the majority of our supporters people who were employers um, 
people in the public and private sector, people in education, were extremely puzzled that we didn't seem to know anything about trans because LGBT is a very common mm. kind of almost an HR category. And I know I'm sensitive to um, terminology, even like BAME, you know, people don't like these letters that lump everybody yeah, yeah. together. But I was working at Aviva at the time I joined and I was actually co-chair of Aviva Pride. And when I joined the board, I was actually quite surprised. I, I kept finding I had to explain to people that, no, we're LGB, we don't do tea. Mm. So, uh, so we made a change at that stage to become what we describe as trans inclusive, because there are obviously organisations who specialise mm. on the topic of, of, uh, of trans. And so, I mean, the, you've very graciously, I think, skipped across those first 25 years and the, you know, huge role that Stonewall played in, you know, massive, massive changes from 1989 when Section 28 was sort of bubbling under and, and obviously a huge part of the sort of forming of the Equality Act and all kinds of, you know, m massive shifts that perhaps some younger um, LGBT people, you know, you sort of take for granted almost. You didn't realise that that was ever, ever a thing. Um, but you, you touch on, funnily enough, your um, the, 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 the the corporate bit, the business bit. And I'm really interested to talk to you about the strategy and the money, because running any organisation, you have to make choices, right? You can't do everything. You have to prioritise. And also, as a charity, you have to know where you get the, the money from. And I think not everybody knows how Stonewall sort of runs. So it's not a, it's not a membership organisation as such, is it? You can't join, oh, right. pay your £7 to be a member of it. So it's sort of what I call po po possibly being reductive, you know, bucket shaking kind of, you know, small donations and then corporate partners and grants and foundations I'm guessing yes it has it has multiple income streams and interestingly the very first Stonewall dinner that I went to I remember Ben Sumskull who was the CEO at the time saying we never accept money from government because as you rightly say uh, Stonewall was formed not because there was a lack of of gay rights organizations around section 28 but as a specific response to that that piece of legislation in Margaret Thatcher's government, in, an infamous piece of legislation which they didn't prevent going into law, but it was one of the things they campaigned against. And actually what we found going forward was ev even the government wanted us to take on um, assignments to uh, go into schools where actually with some irony in a way, because the whole reason we were formed was because there was some unsettling stuff going on on schools. And then we became the government's sort of preferred supplier in a way to to help educate um, schools so they knew how to comply with the Equality Act and have usable resources that were suitable for the eight, you know, the different age groups of, of children. And I remember some discussion at the board on that point <laughs> of whether we were, you know, going to accept money uh, from the government as well. So multiple, multiple sources and happily during the period that, um, that I was chair, revenue was growing all the time from all sorts of different places. Mm -hmm. And as you say, what was important and helpful was that there were multiple sources of it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a marketing person by yeah. background, so I inevitably think about you know, segmentation and, and not customers so much, of course, they're, they're supporters, but, but one is led as well by where the demand is. So mm -hmm. what, what you're not doing is producing things that people don't want. You're trying to actually respond to where a m much more, more increasingly complex uh, set of supporters uh, wanted from us. That's good. So what, that, if we think about that time when you were um, the chair of the board, you, what were those sorts of demands? What were people, organizations approaching Stonewall and saying, can you help us with you know, X, Y, Z, what sorts of things were you having to sort of come up with as solutions for them? Well, as you rightly say, there's more demands than you can ever yeah. respond to. But, but the particular discussions that I um, recall, and I remember us consulting um, founders at, at, at the time, were people wanted us to be more involved on an international basis. 
So we did a lot of work, which was not always in the public domain, but helping uh, LGBT activists in places like Russia and Poland and right. um, and Africa, you know, really difficult places. So so we would help people um, overseas. We did a really big campaign in sport because um, at that time there was a campaign Paddy Power uh, developed, which again was controversial. I think Stonewall is very good at uh, going into controversial spaces, but Paddy Power developed this Rainbow Laces campaign, which has mm -hmm. now become uh, yeah. a Stonewall asset, in fact, that we, we persuaded them to let us have it once they'd done their campaign. So sport was another arena where it was felt, we, we were in the business of the law has changed, but the reality for people hasn't. Yeah. And so, so the demand was all about, please can you help us understand how to comply with the act, how to go beyond the act, People wanted to have inclusive cultures in their organisations. Uh, and so really, as I say, public, private sector, wherever it was coming from, everyone wanted to know, OK, there's been this incredible era of, of progress in the law. How do we actually now implement that? And I have to tell you that even today in 2021, uh, our research says that 35 percent of LGBT people are still not out at work. So the job was never done in terms of the shame that people meant to feel, made to feel, the discrimination they may experience and uh, organisations wanting to be inclusive. Mm. We still find in sport, um, just today I see an NFL player has come out in America and this is still regarded as newsworthy. It's not commonplace mm. even now for people to come out uh, as gay. Um, thanks. Um... Jan, I'm I'm gonna <laughs> I can't resist picking up on this point about your um, marketing background because as I say I I, I am too um, a recovering marketer and um, I wonder about um, because the 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 brand of Stonewall I can see that Levi in the chat is talking about the size of the organisation um, Levi was a, a volunteer in the 90s and it was teeny tiny five paid staff and now it's now it's big so the size of the organisation in terms of the number of people who work there is obviously much bigger. But the sort of the brand of Stonewall is is hugely influential, very recognisable. And I remember when I moved to London, I moved to London in 1997. I remember buses up and down Oxford Street that said on them, you know, people are gay, get over it. And that's the sort of a very famous um, slogan. And so I wonder, given given the sophistication of the marketing of Stonewall and how much that's been a part of its ability to be so successful, um, do you do things like, or does, you might not know because you're not part of it anymore, but did, did you when you were there have things like sentiment tracking towards it? You know, how do people feel? You know, what, what's, what is, what's the sort of vibe within the community and outside of it of how Stonewall is perceived? Well, it, well there was some basic invasion like you, that was the sort of stuff I was, I was um, looking for. We, we didn't spend huge amounts of money uh, on marketing because to be honest, that Stonewall is all about getting on with the business of doing the business so we're trying to work with organizations on the ground actually doing the work um, but I remember being quite interested and it was quite sobering to cover that what you and I would know as spontaneous awareness of Stonewall as a brand was around seven or eight percent which was way way lower than um, than I suppose I expected it to be it's probably gone up a bit <laughs> in the last year um, but where we were higher was with prompted, prompted awareness. So if you mentioned the name Stonewall, people would go, "Ah, oh, yes, I've, I've, I've heard of them. Um, but I, when I was chair, I talked about the fact that one of the things of legislative change, whilst it's exciting and it makes progress, it's also a big thrill because you get this like scoring a goal. You know, there's this, this huge surge of excitement. Yeah. You feel like you've gained, you've gained yards for everybody. And one of the things I talked about at the time was that that was not what it was going to feel like anymore. The way yeah. it should feel in Stonewall was about it being increasingly professional and it was the inch by inch progress. It was document by document, policy approach by policy approach, ev encouraging everybody to feel that wherever they were starting from, they could make progress. And that's why the Workplace Equality Index was so important for people because organizations like to benchmark themselves they like to have best practice and stonewall's approach which i 
um, really loved as a marketing person was that you weren't creating dependency on Stonewall. That was not what we were trying to do. What we were all about was empowering people, connecting people, getting people to share best practice, because who knew what were the best ways of, yeah. of uh, improving the inclusiveness of your workplace. So Stonewall would suggest things, advise things, but actually the really um, you know, interesting stuff was being done by other organizations and, and organizations learning from them. So the marketing was almost like a word of mouth uh, referral process, I guess you would say, where people said it's been really helpful to be working with Stonewall. Um, you know, why won't you work with them too? Mm -hmm. And like any customer base or, or supporter base, people would come and go. There were people who felt they outgrew Stonewall, to be absolutely honest about it. Um, they would start their own schemes. Quite often they recruited Stonewall staff, which was in itself kind of problematic. You know, you'd have incredibly talented people working at Stonewall and they would be paid an awful lot better going and working in organisations because the point about diversity and inclusion, as everybody knows, is it hasn't just been about LGBT in the last decade. You know, everybody's been trying to improve the cultures of their workplaces right across the board. Uh, and so the methodology that Stonewall was using could be equally applied yeah. to other minority other groups, yes. which is what which was what lent itself to us thinking about, um, you know, I've talked about sport already, international. There was no relationship with Northern Ireland when I came on the board. And one of the things we did was we established a partnership with the Rainbow Project so that we would have presence in Northern Ireland because Northern Ireland were lagging behind mm. uh, the other nations. We have uh, an office in Scotland, an office in Wales, quite specifically because of the difference between the different nations. So I suppose I was sitting in, in Stonewall, England, uh, as it were. And we also were aware of the racism that existed within the LGBT communities. And so we worked hard to both support UK Black Pride uh, uh, and, and developed a partnership with them as well, which I was very uh, proud of. So we were doing work within Stonewall and on ourselves, as well as trying to advise other organizations about yeah. uh, how they could pro progress on LGBT. So we were making sure we were educating ourselves, we were uh, developing a race equity program, for instance. So um, I think for all of us, we're all a kind of work in progress when it yeah. comes to having inclusive cultures. Thanks, Jan. Um, I'm going to bring in um, first few people from um, the room. Um, some interesting and I think good questions. Maybe we'll start with Danny. Danny Ahrens. I'm not sure if I pronounced your surname right. Um, Danny, are you there? Hello, Danny. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, you're making a point in the chat, Danny, about um, how the, the, the how did the board decide not to take the government money? How did the sort of decision making process mm. work? Just sort of. Unpick yeah, I mean that, that was it. interesting. I felt like Jan started off saying, "Oh, Ben Somerskill said we never take government money," but it, what I was interested then was what happened after that. How did they? change that policy and why did they change that policy and if they had already a position which I'm guessing was some kind of ethical position conflict of interest we don't take government money because we're trying to influence government policy presumably uh, how did that change and and also relatedly was there a similar consideration around taking or developing kind of diversity champion programs as an income stream for Stonewall mm. um, and therefore, and, and is was there consideration around whether that produces a conflict of interest in relation to depending on funding from many multinational corporations, military institutions, and so on? I mean, I know there's been quite a lot of criticism of Stonewall from 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 the left on that basis. That yeah. you know, if you if you're relying on the money of those people, then you're not in a position to argue against those power structures. Thanks, um, Danny. And actually, before I come back to Jan to um, answer this question, it probably is worth, Jan, just explaining to people in case they don't know what the diversity champions thing is. It's been in the news a bit recently. What, as, as a company or whatever, what do I need to um, commit to or what do I get if I am a diversity champion? It's like, what is that, that thing that is called diversity champions? Well, well, diversity champions was developed um, many years ago. I think it was 
around 2001 or so. Um, and it was specifically for those organizations who wanted to indicate that they were trying to make their workplaces more inclusive. So you were allowed to, for instance, you know, use the Stonewall logo on your recruitment material. So it was, it was a bit like a, we're a LGBT inclusive work in progress um, organization. And it meant that you could get access to Stonewall's re resources and advice. Um, the fee structures have changed, obviously, a lot over that time. I'm not familiar with what it is now, but I think it's a, it's a couple of thousand pounds to join. And then if you are a diversity champion, what that means is that should you choose to take part in the Workplace Equality Index, you get feedback on your um, on how you did. So one of the things Stonewall was doing was encouraging as many people as possible to learn how to have more inclusive workplaces. So they didn't want entering into this benchmarking process to be inhibited because of fees that had to be paid. Mm -hmm. And also you can imagine at the beginning, people were very unsure how they would do. So I understand that the very first time the index was done, pe people were sort of anonymous because they didn't know how they were going to come out. So there were sort of almost like, you know, blanks. And then as people got uh, more familiar, more keen to be ranked, then they would share who they were. So anyone can take part in the index and get a result. But if you're a diversity champion, you actually get somebody who will come and take you through your scores and explain what other companies have, have done and, and um, why you did what you did. Because the idea of it is it's a, it's a program of constant improvement. It's, it, and it's quite, I have to tell you, it's quite challenging doing it. I mean, when I was, you know, part of Aviva Pride, we used to help kind of complete the form. It's a non-trivial exercise because mm -hmm. you actually have to provide evidence for what you've done. So it's not a who knows who kind of judging. We're, we're really trying to make it um, an evidence-based uh, way of of um you know you can't just say you've done this or yeah. that with your policies you would show us the the document you know to use that as an example so the whole point of it was no one ever gets 100 percent, and everybody's trying to gradually improve and so the bar would raise over time as people yeah. got better yeah. and then there were some people who left it completely because they sort of you know once you were in the top 10 you would go to something else and there was also um global diversity champions, so organisations who were multinational, who had very particular um, different requirements and issues to deal with. So they they formed a, a group, which was something they wanted to do. Okay, cool. And then to Danny's specific question about um, conflict of interest, this is a common theme in, in um, charities, you know, an organisation approaches you and says, you know, we want to do this thing, and you sort of have to do your due diligence and figure out, you know, if we take the money and do the work, is there a reputational risk and all that kind of stuff? How did that, both in the decision to take the government money and then on the sort of relationship with corporations, how did that play out in terms of decision making? Well, I, I think the thing to say about a charity is that when people offer you money, you know, you're almost obliged to, to, to take it. I mean, if you remember that scandal around the, the President's Club, a lot of charities got caught out because do you remember that awful dinner when, when oh when with all the people's people, bottoms were being pinched yeah, there yeah, was a lot yeah. of inappropriate behavior yeah, um yeah. and we had a big discussion about that at the board because i was extremely relieved to know that we were not a recipient of that money but that but that as an example of the sort of gosh what do you do when there's been a slightly scandalous way of raising the funds that you wouldn't want to be um yeah. associated with so you, you know, you would have ethical discussions then where you may choose from a reputational point of view rather than because of um, anything else that, that you didn't want to be associated with. But in a way, our job is to, is to get the job done. I know Stone will have a, a policy around, around ethics that's constantly um, reviewed and the board look at that. Mm. Um, with regard to the government, I mean, I think Ben was making a bit of a joke because I don't think the government were trying to give us money. But the reason it was important to us to discuss was because he had said that in public. I was concerned to make sure that 
we you know what why had he said that and therefore mm -hmm. was it okay i think from a from a perspective of funds we didn't want to be relying on government funds so we were always mindful about what proportion and the money that we've had from government has always been for particular projects where we managed yeah. to do something for three years or five years and actually we were extremely concerned to make sure that other organizations were always pitching for it because mm -hmm. um, one of the criticisms of Stonewall is how much wealthier we seem than other organizations. And um, certainly we had a concern not to be soaking up, you know, loads of money when other organizations would benefit from it. We didn't want to be the only voice, mm -hmm. um, you know, developing resources and, and offering advice. Yeah. So, um, I hope that there was, it was quite, Danny, it was quite a multifaceted question. I can't remember, didn't take notes. I didn't realize it was going to have so many points to it. But um, I, I do remember a big discussion about Paddy Power. Um, so for instance, I've mentioned the rainbow laces. Paddy Power had done an extremely distasteful um, poster on the underground, something to do with, I can't remember exactly, but it was something to do with Ladies' Day um, and going to Ascot and men dressed up as women and, and it was oh, right. really, really, right. really offensive to trans people. So, so things like this would crop up all the time. Very often the team, as in uh, Ruth Hunt, the CEO, they would deal with it. And so it would come to the board if, it, if there seemed to be, you know, something that they didn't feel they could, they could yeah. resolve. But uh, certainly with regard to Paddy Power, our view was that the opportunity to get them spending a huge amount of money on a campaign that we could influence so it wasn't making distasteful comments you know we could prevent because they do kind of like yeah being scandalous for its own sake so if we could prevent them from saying something terrible and actually help us make inroads into the the football association we decided we would we would work with them and i know this wouldn't be everyone's position but i feel I feel I can stand by that decision because in the end we got the FA themselves kind of um, taking on rainbow laces as a regular feature of their of their calendar. And I think it's had such an incredible impact at a at a grassroots level as well as I mean in its original yeah. um, in its original concept, it was all very Premier League orientated. And you know, how come there are there were out lesbian footballers in the elite sport, but not um, not the men. Yeah, um, I, th I think it's still like that. But it's our really point was, it's not about who's going to be the first out footballer. It's about the fact that we want everyone who plays sport to feel they can they can be themselves. And yeah. um, thanks, um, Jan. I'm, I'm conscious of time's racing on, and we've got so much still to get through. I want to bring in a couple more contributions from the room. Um, if we can, and then um, get into um, the sort of next phase of questions and things. Maybe I I just really like to understand um, sort of it's a softer question really, but sort of feelings and dispositions. There's um, Levi Pay has contributed a few times in the chat. I don't know if you're there, Levi, and are able to come on because um, you've obviously been involved in Stonewall for donkey's years as a volunteer and, and what have you, and you're talking about experiences of, of coming across. Just reflect a little bit about how your relationship with the organisation has evolved over time. I'd, I'd say it's a, a play in three acts, I think. <laughs> there was the there was the, the, the time in the 90s when I was a full-time volunteer there for a best part of a year and a half. Mm. Absolutely loved it. Small organisation, passionate, professional, and focused on achieving very clear legal goals through lobbying. Uh, then there was a time when I moved into equalities roles in different sectors, and I effectively became a customer of Stonewall. So they were yeah. they were kind of they, I was a target for the diversity champion scheme. Right, right. And and I I was interested because I was like, oh, I used to work for Stonewall. Come in, tell us all about it. And actually, I found the whole process really difficult because it was a hard sell. I, it was three people turning up, very glossy, very suited, very and very a lot of manipulation you know or if you don't have this membership how will you get expert advice can you really rely 
rely on your internal lawyers. Um, and it was this feeling that Stonewall was growing. The reason I mentioned the size is yeah. because I take Jan's point about charities finding it difficult to turn down money, but I think that's true about sustaining meaningful charitable activity. It shouldn't be about you know, we can't turn down money in order to grow and feed our own machine, which is what I was starting to pick up. So I was starting to feel uncomfortable and I didn't ever take an organisation into the diversity champion scheme for various reasons uh, when I was a uh, head of equality and director of equality. And then the third act, if you like, is when Stonewall not only embraced trans rights, which I fully support and I, I absolutely think that was the right move, but they embraced a form of trans rights which was predicated entirely on gender identity as a concept, this idea of an immutable gender identity which must be affirmed all, in all contexts and embraced a no debate approach mm -hmm. of, 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 of avoiding sensible, rational discussion about real, genuine conflicts of rights. And that combination for me was lethal in terms of my relationship with them. And I now find myself writing to diversity champion organisations that I'm a member or a, or a customer of and suggesting with my own personal experience in mind that they withdraw from the scheme. So it's a real sort of mm. transition, if you like, in terms of my own, my own journey with the organisation. Thanks uh, very much. Um... Levi, I think the, the, the play in three acts is uh, um, something that is not is not unique to Levi. But I wonder if um, do you know what? There's lots in there that I want. I definitely want to pick up on. But let's go back to in order to get back to where Levi just left us. Let's go back if we can to 2015. And um, Jan, you touched on it at, at the beginning that you're sort of facing. Um, there's a sort of a strategic decision-making process that is happening in the organization and you and and as a, as a board you set about a consultation a, a quite a big consultation when you're thinking through you know how do we how do we play this tell it tell us about the consultation what what happened what did you do what did you do well it it, it took um a long time to sort of work out what and how were we going to do to become uh, trans inclusive so I suppose the the easy and quick decision was that, that that was the right thing to do because it was really weird that we weren't trans inclusive we were an absolute outlier uh, in terms of uh, general organize other organizations I mean pride anywhere you care to look everybody was trans inclusive except for us so that was really weird um, we're also called Stonewall so there was something particularly uneasy we talked about brands and uh, brand roots but to name yourself after a riot in New York where right in the center it was sort of self-proclaimed queens um, and and mixed race as well that that was uneasy so the 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 easy decision was we need to we need to think about how we're going to become trans inclusive the consultation was very important because there were a number of different groups to consult with. I mean, I've already told you that, as it were, our customers, our supporters were asking us to get into this space. The board were very keen to. Um, we had a new chief executive in Ruth Hunt, who was very confident in this domain. But there needed to be, as I said, work that had to be done on ourselves to educate ourselves. And we also had some bridge building to do with the trans communities, because um, Stonewall had not been trans inclusive up until that point so it wasn't just a question of the board saying right we're just gonna have a t-shirt that says some people are trans get over it and that's it and we're just you know we slap a t on everything we wanted to approach this um, intelligently and carefully and to know whether this was something that the trans communities even wanted from us um, it may have been convenient to employers to have this categorization of LGBT in a kind of one stop shop, but, but we needed to make sure that we were listening to the voice of the trans communities. And I say trans communities very deliberately because my sense of it was hugely fragmented. Um, uh, people all ages, all different backgrounds doing all sorts of um, things. And so we set out to consult with, um, we had a, a series of events with um, parents of trans children, as well as uh, the trans communities themselves, all age groups, all backgrounds that probably lasted about uh, 12 months. And 
we then formed, again, very deliberately, something called the Stonewall Trans Advisory Group. So we actually, separate from the board, we, we set up an advisory group, uh, group who would develop what was went on to be called the Vision for Change, which was, so what is it? If Stonewall were to start to become a, an advocate for uh, trans communities and be more inclusive, what would their agenda be so that we had that outside group? And in fact, over time, the chair of the Stonewall Advisory Group joined the main board, but that things like that didn't happen straight away either. Even, even when we'd issued a vision for change, we were then, it took years for Stonewall to gradually transform their resources, their materials, the kind of research they were doing. So there was no kind of one moment where we just like went, well, Yesterday we were LGB and today we're LGBT. The whole thing happened very gradually. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been credible, um, and it would have been clumsy. And you know, we needed to move at the at the pace that the organisation could actually cope with. And I'm sure mistakes were made along the way uh, in the way that we we evolved. But we hoped by not going hurtling at us at speed. Uh, we had more of a chance of getting it right because 25 years of being one kind of organisation, it takes time. I mean, we are now talking, it must be seven or eight years ago that yeah. I was appointed chair and we began that journey. So in some ways it's quite, it's rather fascinating to me that it's become such a source of excitement relatively recently because it was going on slowly and evolving uh, over quite a long period of time. So if we go back, for instance, to the Workplace Equality Index, there, it, you know, there were like, in two years' time, we'll start to evaluate how you're doing on, on LGBT plus T. So, so all the time we were trying to give people time to, to prepare and think about how they wanted to be uh, trans-inclusive. So, um, Jan, I'm conscious that um, they're right. Um, I've given you loads of airtime, so um, uh, I'm, I'm going to bring more people in. But before I do, I've got one um, key question I want to put to you, which is at that point in the consultation, di did you include, did you consult with people who were not part of the trans community? Did you, did you consult, do you look back and think we appropriately brought in the perspectives of the Stonewall staff and lesbian, gay and bisexual people, you know, who, who are not trans at that point to see how they felt about this move in, in, on reflection. Well, 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 what I, well, well, what I would say was that um, I was very aware of many stakeholders, the trans community uh, and the parents of trans were the ones where we had to do this formal engagement because we had no existing relationship, but we certainly got um, a huge amount of feedback from, as I've said, supporters, and I and I'm abs I absolutely know that not everybody was comfortable with it. So this was not a non-controversial thing to do. I was aware um, that that there were people who were not on board, and there were private conversations that went on. Um, some to me directly, some some to Ruth. Uh, you know, so we 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 absolutely got feedback from across the board. I don't feel in right. any way that that Stonewall made this change without their eyes wide open would be how I'm I would just it. I'm just um so conscious of time. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to do my best to balance. Um let's bring in a few um more um people from the people who've been making comments in the chat and everything just to make sure I'm doing my job about um a, a balance. Perhaps I don't know, Johnny, do you want to come on and and uh, give a um share a, a, a point of view of your experiences hiya hi hello, hello. yeah Thanks for your uh, patience. that's perfectly all right um uh my um my, my sort of experience with stonewall is that i um i mean i grew up with stonewall and i i i was a teenager when stonewall was founded and um uh and uh, you know supported them through through most of my adult life um until they they took uh, a decision which seemed to me to to lead to some very unpleasant side effects. I mean, I think the the moment that Stonewall a few years ago um, labelled the lesbians who protested at Pride, I think it was 2018, as transphobic, was the moment I I sort of finally 
decided I could no longer support Stonewall, having, you know, sort of collaborated with them uh, a few years earlier on, on a project. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel that what, what, what's really contained in Jan's idea of, of trans inclusivity has been the transformation of Stonewall um, into a gender identity activist organization, which has uh, reconfigured uh, all of its policies, all of its definitions, its entire glossary around uh, and the definitions that it that it um, that it promotes through its through its activities it, into a sort of dictionary of gender identity theory um, to the point that um, that uh, LGB people LGB people who want to understand their same sex desire as same sex desire mm. have become demonised by Stonewall. Mm. Stonewall sort of reinstating a kind of gay shame among those of us who, for whom our sexuality is all about um, sexed bodies and not about, and not about gender. Um, and, um, and I think the demonization, particularly of lesbians who've wanted to say, hang on, you know, uh, lesbian can't have a penis. And, and that's, that's just how I feel. The demonization of those people, and it, it affects gay men less, but it affects us too. I think it's been disgraceful. And I think it has led to um, an utter loss of moral authority, certainly in, in the eyes of many. And that's why, that's why we now have organizations <laughs> like LGB Alliance. So, you know, that's, that's my tip. Anna. So, so Johnny, you, you, like you say, you've worked, worked with and alongside three, three. Stonewall this, this whole time. Um, no, 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 not this whole time. I did, I worked for a couple of years on a project. On an oh, I see. And then uh, your kind when, of relationship with the yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so if, if you were, um, <laughs> this is a slightly ludicrous question but if you if you if it was down to you to decide what Stonewall should do at this point <laughs> what would be what would be your take at this point I'd say disband uh, at this really? point I, I think it's gone beyond uh the the, the salvageable um I um I think it's a great shame but um I think that so much damage has been done and so much hurt caused and so many disgraceful um decisions made and and disgraceful things said i mean the whole no debate policy was was an attempt to delegitimize um people who feel that sex matters um and i think the i i i've, I've tried to th those of us who grew up who, who have grown up with stonewall and who feel and who have felt so positive about it in the past have spent sort of varying amounts of time getting to the point that we just think it's just done now. It's time to to, to throw in the towel, and it's uh, you know there's a not there's not quick easy decision. Stonewall Stonewall achieved the um, the uh, the social justice that I enjoy as an adult gay man. Yeah, I feel yeah. Stonewall's the mothership for someone of my generation. You know, it really is. But I I think it's done so much damage now, and I mean social damage in 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 the in, in the country. It's um, and I think we're just on the edge of starting now to understand how great that damage is and how and how irretrievable it is as an organisation. Thanks ever so much, um, Johnny. I'm going to take a couple more if I can. And then if Jan, you want to um, uh, respond, that, that is good too. Hassan, are you there? Hassan Mandani. Hey, Hassan. Hi. Hiya. What do you think yeah. about this? You're, you've, you've, you've agreed a bit with Johnny. You're sort of saying there's a very important point. It's this thing to do with gender ideology, ideology being the operative word, really. Yes, I, I think so. Um, I mean, it seems to me that when um, when Stonewall decided to introduce or, or become more trans inclusive, they, they had a choice of one of two directions. Um, they could have gone down the road of uh, recognizing a trans identity as being a particular unique experience in the same way that being a woman is a, a unique experience um, and one to be valued and honored. But they didn't take that approach. And that, that's one I think most of us could get behind. Instead, what they did was to adopt this concept of gender identity, which then went and muddled, muddied the waters for everybody, particularly as, as, as Joni has just highlighted. Uh, they have redefined my sexuality as being same gender oriented. I'm not I'm same sex oriented. And that's that's a really quite big change to make. And it opens the floodgates for um, 
a lot of definition of, of, of who we are, who, who gay people are, who lesbians are, and how we how we form our relationships. Uh, so I think this was this is what for, for many people this seems to be the key driver of our discomfort uh, with the direction that Stonewall has yeah. taken. Uh, and when we try to discuss this in in open forums, we end up being blocked by this organisation that previously proposed to represent us. And I find that that's really difficult or it's, it's really problematic for, for many of us. Thanks so much, Hassan. Um, it might be a good opportunity perhaps to bring in uh, Christine, if, if you um, are OK to, to come on, Christine. And by the way, just because it took, took us a while to, to get going, we, we may go past um, 7.30 um, a little bit. We don't typically do that at all, just, but it's my fault for not managing the time properly. Um, Hi, Christine. Um, now you, you're, I don't, know what, I don't actually know how to introduce you. It says here, retired trans rights campaign, and that seems a bit rude slightly, um, but you're, you've been a sort of um, advisor, a partner to Stonewall over a period of time. And if we wind the clock back, you ran an organization called Press for Change back in the day, which was a specific organization dedicated to trans rights. That, that's correct, isn't it? Oh, I think we might uh, need to unmute you. Oh, we can hear you. Well, no, I, I think I'm unmuted now. Can okay. you hear me okay? I can hear you, yeah, I can hear you well. I'm sorry, my throat's um, uh, closed up because I've been sitting here saying nothing. Um, yeah, that, that description is a, bit, is a bit mangled, but actually retired uh, trans rights campaigner is perfectly accurate and, uh, and it's not at all insulting because it marks the fact that I've been involved with the trans community for uh, getting on for 40 years. I think actually it's more than 40 years. Mm. Uh, and I've certainly been involved actually in activism uh, for over 30 of those. Mm. Uh, I got involved in um, this organization called Press for Change, which was set up in February 1992. So it'll be 30 years anniversary next February. Um, that was set up because there had been a couple of uh, human rights cases in the European Court of Human Rights. There was one by a man called Mark Rees in 1986 and one by a woman called Caroline Cossey, uh, also known as the, uh, as the model Tula, in uh, 1989 and 1990. Um, so, and what had happened as a result of those cases is whereas before as trans people, we had really got no rights in effect. We had, had no employment rights. We had no rights to being treated on the NHS. Mm. Uh, we could be outed uh, in a variety of ways and with the final indignity because our, we were officially of the gender or the sex that was recorded in our birth certificate. That's how we had to be buried as well because of the law around what actually goes on a, on a gravestone. So you could live your entire life, and I've lived more than half of my adult life uh, as, a, as, a, as a woman, uh, and then uh, the law forced you to be insulted in death. So there, were, there was a long string of, um, of, of indignities we suffered, but what actually had happened was because of these two uh, cases in the European court was that we discovered there was perhaps a way in which we could do something about this. And so Press for Change was set up as both a lo lobbying and an education group mm. aimed at using strategic litigation to, uh, to tackle some of these injustices. And the first case we won was in 1996 in the European Court of Justice, which isn't the same court, uh, but it actually confirmed that uh, it was unlawful uh, to discriminate in employment against anyone who was planning to undergo uh, was undergoing or had undergone mm. gender reassignment. And that actually is the basis for a large, larger part of what is today in the Equality Act. It was put into British law because we won, and then uh, the Labour government in 1999 wanted to put that into, into the Sex Discrimination Act uh, because it was recognised as being sex discrimination. Um, as a result of that, we've actually had that kind of legislation protecting our, our rights across employment for now, what's that, 1999, 22 years? So that um, was a win for press, the press for change. That was a press for change. Um, that was a press for change win. And that's yeah. what actually put us on the map. And also 
gave us the opportunity to talk to officials about uh, tackling wider injustices. But we also had a strategic case in 1997 against the health authority, which was using underhand means to ensure that uh, trans people yeah. in their health area could never access gender reassignment treatment. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as a result of a string of these cases going to the European Court of Human Rights in 2002, the European Court found unanimously in favour that Britain had to have uh, a means of legally recognising the reality of the change of our living circumstances when we had transitioned and were living uh, as our acquired gender. So Chris, um, I'm so sorry, forgive me for, for, for interrupting, um, but just to try and keep on the sort of Stonewall thing. I guess that a question I'm thinking of in relation to Press for Change is that if Press for Change is, is having these um, successes, you know, campaigning successes and lobbying successes and, and, and making progress, it, it, the, the question has to remain why do why does why can't stonewall and press for change just exist as part well, of stonewall does this and press for change does that that would seem to have been quite a successful model in the noughties were we talking about that yeah it, it was and that's why we we plowed our own furrow i mean we're we we're almost the same age of organizations and we recognized between ourselves that uh we had specialities and what we were pursuing was very different from what Stonewall had to pursue, which was you know, tackling things like uh, gays in the military. <coughs> we so had why, why bring the two together then? Well, let me finish. Questions. Yeah, because um, yeah, we were not on the same scale. You know, um, you've, you've heard um, Jan describing the way that Stonewall grew in professionalism. Yeah. We were half a dozen people working in our spare time. I had a full-time job. All of my colleagues had full-time jobs mm. and we had no money. The most money we ever got um, in a year was about 5,000 pounds, but we were representing uh, a, a community of people who were largely uh, yeah, out of work because of discrimination. Sure, uh, they sure. were pun so it was about scale, really. It, 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 was, about, it was about scale and also yeah. you know, scalability, because while we were doing what our original objective was, which was to change the laws to, that underpin uh, yeah, our ability to live lives in safety and, uh, and, and, uh, and peace, um, you, know, you could do what we were doing, because most of our campaigning was about education. It was mm -hmm. about uh, working with lawyers. And ultimately, it was about working in Parliament to see through the legislation that we had brought about. Mm. <coughs> but we actually faced a similar problem to Stonewall, I think, in, uh, in 2005, when the Gender Recognition Act had been passed, when we had largely achieved the legislative changes that we needed to make. And I believe, by the way, that in terms of social uh, inclusion, all minorities go through this business of actually needing to sort out the basic legislation first. Sure. But after, sure. That, but after that, the next job is actually a much harder one. It's about uh, social inclusion. It's about changing hearts and minds. Um, and you know, it doesn't suit a, an organisation that's got half a dozen people working working evenings in hotel rooms, because that's what yeah. my job was, you know, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a, as a consultant. I'm so, conscious, Christine. I'm so yeah, sorry. No, I'm, so, so, I mean, I burned out twice trying to do just that. And uh, I moved away from Press for Change in 2007, realising that the next things we needed to do actually required a different approach. So I got involved with working with the Department of Health, working at some point with the Press Complaints Commission. But um, I, and I also wanted a younger generation to come along and set up new organisations afresh. Mm -hmm. But we would never, ever, given the financial position and size of the trans community, <coughs> have been able to do the kind of work that, uh, that Stonewall sure. was able to do. Okay. And also, so our interests, cool move in that sense. By that, by that point, our interests overlapped so much as well because. Uh, a very large number of trans people identify as uh, you know, same-sex attracted. Um, the, and 
I, I've always contended that the, the, the discrimination that gay and lesbian people face, uh, generally speaking, isn't on the basis of people knowing who they slept with last night, but on the basis of yeah, perceived gender nonconformity. So, I, and, and our enemies actually see us in the same boat. You know, we're all fucking queer, if you'll pardon the expression. That's uh, so they don't, they don't uh, you know, uh, make distinctions, just as if I'm walking home in the dark, uh, a man coming up behind me and attacking me isn't going to check whether I'm trans or not. So oh. yeah, we, we actually, yeah, we need to campaign on the basis of the realities of how people live their lives okay. and the actual problems okay. that they solve, and they, sorry, they, they face. So when Ruth was first talking about um, uh, integrating trans activity into Stonewall. Uh, and I worked very closely with her in the work I was doing at the Department of Health. Um, I said, yeah, I, I thoroughly support it because I don't think we'll ever build up the resource to be able to do this stuff sure. alone. Okay. You've made that point. That's great. Yeah. Thanks, Christine. I'm going to bring in um, a few more people and we are going to keep going just to, I feel like we've not quite done the, the balanced job that, that we should be doing. Um, let, let's see, I don't know, Bev, um, do you want to come in, Bev, if you're around? Hello. Hello, Bev. thank you. Hi, yes, hi, um, I'm um, sorry. Thank you. For thank you very much for organising this evening, and I, I, I accept that it, it's difficult for you. Um, yes, I, I, I put in the chat the reason why we set up um, LGB Alliance. We certainly yeah. didn't, didn't want to. We didn't think, oh, there's any... <laughs> We really uh, uh, want to spend uh, uh, the, this time uh, of our lives doing this. We, we we tried very hard to engage with Stonewall uh, separately. Um, Kate and I only met uh, two years ago, and um, Kate and, and Johnny um, put in a petition asking um, Stonewall to think about its change of direction. And they didn't want to engage with us. And that is a pattern that has actually been the same for the last several years. Mm. There's been no engagement. And this doesn't work. People disagree. If people disagree and you don't you don't talk to them, you 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 can't get anywhere. And this has been profoundly damaging. It's it's been profoundly damaging, I think, to Stonewall. It's been profoundly damaging to gays and, and especially to lesbians. And it's been profoundly damaging to society as a whole. This thing of, of calling people people bigots because uh, you, you don't want to talk to them because they disagree with you. It's really unhelpful and it's harmful, in fact. Thanks ever so much, um, uh, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I come back in there? Because I think, yes, well, uh, let's be busy, okay. yeah. What, what I've got, I think what is vitally important because all of this really, to, to me, seemed to kick off in around about the autumn of 2017. There were, there were bubblings up, but really this all, particularly the nastiness, really kicked off from that point. Yeah. And it was be because Theresa May had announced a policy to, to reform the Gender Recognition Act. You know, I'm part architect of the Gender Recognition Act, so I know the ins and outs of how it works and things we actually had to compromise in 2004 to get it passed at all. And what struck me early on, and I and why I think Stonewall is absolutely right to have adopted the, the, the approach that it has adopted, is because uh, the, the vacuum created by Theresa May was filled by people telling a lot of porkies about what the change was going to involve and actually what the Gender Recognition Act did. Uh, and consequently, you know, when, when people are uh, arguing in bad faith, when they're telling lies about what is going to happen, uh, when they're actually being quite abusive online, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of polishing of turds here, I'm afraid, because, because people are not honest about what they do away from a camera. Um, so, so given all of that, and knowing what they were doing and what they were trying to do, and also from my point of view, I can see no kind of uh, approach you could take which wouldn't involve taking away from me freedoms uh, that I have had uh, for 35, 40 years. Um, yeah, anything that people say they want to, to be able to negotiate over what, how, how they regard me, for instance. You know, and there are plenty of people online who would delight in calling me a man, 
so that they can then slag me off. There's certainly um, a lot of nastiness. That that is for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And 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 you know, the, and that is part and parcel of trying to you know push us away from the space which we've been occupying quietly and uh, politely for as long as I can remember. Now, I've written a book about 50 years, 60 years of the history of trans people in Britain. People who want to come into this discussion, actually, I think it's, it, they would do <laughs> very well to actually read this, or there are plenty of other books, uh, who actually, yeah, so to actually explain the history of where we've been going for the last 60 years before we came to this god awful backlash, which is horrible, and I wouldn't have with, wished on my worst enemy. Okay. But I'm actually, right. I'm also slightly concerned that of all the people who have actually come on to speak tonight, I would say that they come from a, from that sort of. Uh, I'm not going to say that they're exactly the same as what I've described, but they seem to come from the same mindset, and unfortunately, having perhaps bought some of the misinformation that's been spun uh, over okay. the last four years. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much, um, uh, Christine. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that, I, that, that there are more people that I want to, to hear from um, and to pick up on some of this. And then I'd like to give Jan an opportunity to respond to some of the sort of the, the, the core things um, that are frustrating people, partic particularly about the um, no debate um, a, a policy, which I think is one of the things that causes people to feel exasperated um, at, at the sort of not having the opportunity to to input or feeling that they haven't been um, given the opportunity to input. So if if um, Kate is there, Kate Harris, um, perhaps let's hear from you. And then I'd like to hear from my colleague, Matthew Dancona as well. Um, oh yes, I can see Kate. Hiya, Kate. Oh, hang on. Hi. Oh yes, we can hear you. Go for it. First of all, thank you very much, Tortoise, for hosting this. Christine, I think you've been talking far too much and you're not being sensitive to the fact that there are 100 people on this call Many of us want to express our opinion, so please be sensitive. Jan, I'm gonna direct some comments to you. First of all, thank you for being on this call. I tried for two and a half years to talk to you and Ruth Hunt. There are people on this call with me who wrote you letter after letter after letter. Johnny and I set up a petition. We got 10,000 signatures. It was very, very radical. It asked you to have a dialogue with us. You rejected all of those things and I still don't understand why. If we don't debate, we will not move forward. Mm -hmm. Without debate, we will not move forward. The only reason that we had to form LGB Alliance was because you, Jan, as chair of the trustees of Stonewall, refused to have a debate even a debate that was moderated by an independent person. I want to say about Stonewall, Stonewall has been the best of my life and the worst of my life. I worked with Stonewall for years. I raised money for Stonewall. Ruth Hunt was my account manager. Stonewall is in my DNA. Now I want to tell you, Jan, my life has been ruined, ruined because of what you and Ruth and Nancy and various people did directly contravening agreements that you had made with us, that you would not add the T to a charity that was promoting LGB rights. It's not important that my life has been ruined because I'm old and big enough and ugly enough to manage it. Can you explain to me why Stonewall is not supporting Kira Bell and every single transitioner whose life has been ruined because of your adoption of gender identity theory and queer theory. How do you feel about the fact that in the US today, there are 36,000 girls who are on a waiting list to have top surgery? Whereas, I mean, is that something that you can sleep with at night? Because I can't. So LGB Alliance is focused on telling the truth, having fact-based dialogue, telling the truth to girls that it's great to be a girl it's great to be a lesbian. You do not have to cut off your breasts and pretend you're a boy because you're a gender non-conforming girl. Stonewall, you are responsible for this. And I blame you for not supporting Kira Bell and every other detransitioner. I blame you for supporting 
men's involvement in rugby. How can you do that? That's clearly dangerous. And I blame you fundamentally for lying. Gender identity ideology is based on a pack of lies. And everyone on this call who actually considers the background to gender identity theory and queer theory knows that. I would finally like to say that LGB Alliance, and I suspect everyone on this call, fully supports the rights of transsexuals to every equality under the law. We don't want them discriminated against at work. We don't want them discriminated in housing or in health. And the fastest growing demographic that supports LGB Alliance are transsexuals. So I'll leave you with those thoughts. And finally to Benjamin Kern, please stop lying about us. We're sick of it. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kate. I'm noting in the chat um, a couple of people um, sort of saying with there's, there's some perspectives here that we're missing. I'm going to try and lean into those um, as well. And Jan, I, I will obviously give you the opportunity to respond at some point. But let's try um, let's try Matt, and then I'd like to hear from Phoebe, who is a um, a young person who's part of the community. Um, and if you want to weigh in, uh, let me know. Matt, hello. Hi, Liz. Um, just a, a very quick one, which is that one of the things that strikes me uh, about this is that uh, the problems that are being, uh, that are uh, afflicting Stonewall right now are actually problems that uh, afflict campaign organisations and community groups of all scales um, and some businesses too, which is you have a series of phases. The first phase is you're a guerrilla organisation, you're meeting in people's sitting rooms and in pubs, then you get an office, a logo, a slogan, maybe a focus. Mm -hmm. And phase two is you, you enter the, the, the public sphere, you're countercultural. everyone says, what the hell is this? Um, then phase three is that you begin to win and you make an impact and you might even, as Stonewall did and has, change policy and enact the, uh, a, a, a serious player in the enactment of progress or whatever other objective you have. And then you hit the, the fourth phase, which is the danger phase, the peril phase, because you have acquired an institutional memory and a culture, and you've become part, if not of the establishment, then of the landscape. And success can breed success, but it can also breed mistakes. One of which is the there's an impulse in all organizations that have reached phase four to look for scalable products and new routes. And mm -hmm. I think that that may be what's happened here, which is that what looked to Stonewall like a logical um, extension of what it had been doing with great success and focus and compassion has not only uh, confused a great many of its natural allies, but is also involved in a kind of mission creep, which has diverted it from its original principles and has landed it in a great deal of trouble. And, you know, those original principles are so important. And I noticed on Tabitha Morton uh, tweeted this morning, a shocking uh, extent to which there had been a, a number of homophobic attacks um, in Liverpool. And that shows as if one needs to remind anyone on this this thinking that the the original problems that Stonewall was founded to address are by no means solved. So I think I think taking a step back from what can be a very very emotional, very heated discussion can actually reveal some of the problems that we're dealing with here. Thanks, Matt. Um, there were a couple of people actually who, when they were registering to come this evening, wrote. Um, that they sort of saw some um, mirroring of uh, momentum in the Labour Party, for example, in, in, and what happened with Amnesty, as you, as you say. Um, do, do, you, do you feel hopeful that it's salvageable, if we put it in those terms, that Stonewall can bring people back in who might feel oh, let down? I mean, as a straight heteronormative... Maybe you're the wrong person to ask. I, I, I'm not... It's not for me to say. I mean, I, what I what I dearly hope, what I would like to see is um, both trans people and LGB people being, um, you know, properly represented and not at war with each other. Because I think that, you know, if you're if, if you have a 
if you believe as I do in civil rights and the, the, you know, the long and arduous march of civil rights, there are moments like this where groups come into conflict who shouldn't be in conflict because they are unable to resolve um, incommensurable values, which are actually a part of every pluralist negotiation. This is not a unique situation, but it is because we're living in a social media age and because the, the stakes are frankly quite high, it is, uh, it, it is a very toxic one. And I, I, I wish everyone you know, the best and I hope it, it, that this can be resolved. Mm -hmm. Liz, um, can I come back in here, please? Just very because briefly, I, Christine, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know, I know. I've already been, been accused of actually having too much time on this, <laughs> this talk. But I, you know, there is a whole new mythology being spun tonight. And it, it appalls me because I've been working alongside lesbian and gay and bisexual people all my activist life. And the way that this is described, because you seem to somehow have managed to actually acquire a lot of people talking from one side, is that some people are trying to, to, uh, to spin a yarn that, that, that there is a gulf between lesbian in particular mm -hmm. people and, uh, and, and trans people. And um, the evidence is it is just not true. And so long as we're going to have... On. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, I've said I'm you. so sorry. I feel rude. I always feel rude interrupting people, but I just feel like you've had your kind of slice of the, the pie this evening, if that's okay. Phoebe, um, I, you're a young colleague of mine um, here at Tortoise. You're part of the LGBT community. Yeah. What do you make of all us old people talking about this? I, so so I, I'm going to say, um, I'm bi. I, I have a boyfriend, um, but I have um, dated women. And... I only really came out, like I, I, I gently came out, but I kind of probably came out. And when I say came out, I mean, looked to the community a bit more in 2015, which clearly is, you know, kind of a year that a lot of this has started. And I feel that I, I'm finding it really, like really distressing to listen to. And I'm trying to work out why. And I think that part of it is that I just find it, as, as Matt kind of said um, slightly more eloquently, is that, you know, it's really horrible to see this kind of clash within the community because what I want to do is I'm, I'm something that I'm really proud of is to look for that pride in the community. And I'm, I'm finding that that really hard. Um, but I also find that, you know, as Matt said, there is lots of instances where, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've only been out for a little bit, but the first time that I ever went on a date with women, we were harassed in the streets. We were yeah. publicly harassed in the street. I have also faced it in workplaces. Um, thankfully, not at Tortoise. I find it incredibly conclusive place to work. And I'm really proud of that. But, you know, so it feels hard. And I, and I kind of said in the chat and I asked, I, I worry about the loss of Stonewall because I feel like it has this weight in, in, in this field and it's this weight in lobbying. And as soon as you lose bodies like that and they're taken apart from within the community, that can feel incredibly scary to me. And, you know, and I look and, and Jan made a good point about, you know, we're on a world stage. This isn't just about the UK. And you look at Hungary this week, you know, similar, similar legislation to Section 28 has been put into law. Terrifying. It's terrifying. It's terrifying to see that. And so it, that, that's, that's where my worries are is that, you know, I, I hate to see this lack of... Of, of community and I also you know also hate to see um a body a body go but I also I'm, I'm not I'm not sure and I'm just thinking to 10-15 years in the future um and about what the the LGBT community will look like and, and I hope it is more together um but yeah I hope that kind of makes sense and kind of but yeah I, I also I'm just like really happy to have the conversation that we are having a conversation about it too thank you Phoebe it absolutely does um make sense and um brave you to um, come on and actually you're meant to be on holiday this week so above and beyond the call of duty to come and contribute this evening um i'd love to hear from uh ruth kennedy if you're happy to come on and also somebody called george i don't know your surname george so um i'm not sure hiya ruth hi i don't think hi. i should i don't think i should be saying anything i think oh. there are lots of people here who've got more important things to say to me was there something in particular <laughs> well, I'm, just, I'm just interested to know how, what you make of this conversation is it what you expected I think you said you know it was a bit disappointing at one stage it, what, what, oh, no, what I don't think it was me and what what have you got so I'm really grateful that Tortoise is hosting this I think as everyone knows the toxicity 
is just damaging to everyone. And we want to be a society where we can talk about difficult things. Um, and I think hearing from people's individual experiences is important because when people tell their stories, it makes us lean in and listen. Um, you know, I, I'm straight, so you know, in some respects, this is absolutely not my debate. But I, I, you know, think there's so much to celebrate about what Stonewall has done, and is it's so clear that there's masses of work still to do. Hence Phoebe's story. So there's a real need for it. I think, I think there are people in leadership in organisations who really want to make their organisations inclusive of all. And this isn't my personal experience, so I'm saying this secondhand, but my understanding is that it has become very, very difficult because what Stonewall is pushing is a version of trans inclusion, which creates immediate tensions with the rights of other protected groups. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. And the, there are tensions, you know, but it, it should not be controversial to say that in some circumstances, sex matters, and we need to talk about that. And so if Stonewall can't lead that conversation for us, and I guess I would have imagined it would have been, it would have been the best place organization, but if it isn't, who is going to lead that conversation for us? Because as, you know, as a nation, we want to support everybody to be able to live the life that they want to live free, respected, and so on. But where there are tensions in rights, we have to be able to talk. I, I used to play premiership rugby. It is, it is, it's, it's you know, it's, uh, the, the fact that sex matters in sport is, is an issue for me because people who have gone through puberty as a man have physiological attributes, which makes it dangerous for them to be playing contact sport against women. That's yeah, you know, we, how do we do that? We need people who can help us go through that, or through those through those conversations. Thanks ever so much, Ruth. And I'm I'm I, it, I missed it because it was passing the chat earlier on. But there have been uh, the important question of um, trans women in sport. Um, I think is a thinking of its own. Actually, we we should probably re revisit and have a proper go at that conversation with a di with a different group of people. It's this particular thing, very very relevant this week for, for obvious reasons um is george around um he's made a couple of uh comments hi george hi Hello. yeah i think um you were referring to a comment that i made earlier on and, and i guess it's just an observation because this is my first thinking um the i guess the amount of kind of personal spatting going on mm -hmm. between some of the speakers is just a little bit disappointing when i figured i was joining a debate rather than um, an opportunity for people to score points against each other in a public domain. I guess George, that's the point I was making. This is, this is massively unfair, especially considering it's your first thinking, so feel free to, we'll never see you again. But the, the, the kind of exam question is, are gay, gay people better off without Stonewall? What do you think? I can't answer that question personally because I, I don't know enough. Okay. Okay. All right. Fair. Fair. I'll let you off. <laughs> Thanks very much, George, um, for um, uh, giving it a go. I wonder if I might bring in, um, do you know what? I'm going to bring in James Harding because he's sitting there with holding his glasses. James, for those of you that don't know, is the um, co-founder of, of Tortoise. And um, he's a straight man. I don't think it's a, blowing anybody's cover to say that. Um, but James, you, you what what do you make of all this? So I, th I I think it's I think what's really shocking in some ways, just to pick up on George's point, is how many people have either been grateful for just the business of having a conversation, yeah. or frustrated that we didn't get to the heart of the conversation fast enough. Yeah. I.e., that there's this kind That's of my fault. sorry about that. No, 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 no. Actually, Liz, I think the opposite. I think actually what you did was really thoughtful, which is 
let's not sort of rush to the fire. Let's make sure that we give some context so that we can have the kind of conversation we've had, which is, you know, really, really decent. You, you should have been here, George, the night before, uh, where there was a real set to, I have to say, about the origins of COVID. So maybe we're getting a bit of a pattern here. But I think that what's really interesting is that if we're honest with ourselves, just as a small group taught us, this is a really, this is, this is a really divisive issue, even amongst a small newsroom. Right. And the thing that's the most valuable about it and a conversation like this, and thanks to you and Mark for leading and orchestrating it is actually what we're reminded is there's just a lot to learn. Right. There's a lot to learn about people's different points of view. And I think that having the conversation and the argument for the debate is overwhelming. I know you're going to come back to Jan on that. And I know it's a central point that Kate and Bev were making, too, which is. The, the central to this is the requirement for debate. And the, and the difficulty I think that people have, certainly people with my kind of instincts, is that you want an outcome of debate that's kind of consensual. You want to somehow go through the process of discussion and come out and feel as though you've come to some agreement. And sometimes that's not the nature of debate. Sometimes the truth is that the nature of debate is better understanding, but not agreement. And for me personally, that's what's been incredibly useful about listening to this conversation is I thought, oh, I really, really understand things I just didn't understand before. Um, and so I think that's incredibly valuable. And I think, Liz, the fact of actually taking time and being patient, I think, has been brilliantly done. So thank you. Thank you, James. Um, I am tempted. It's eight minutes to eight now and everybody really needs a gin after this discussion. Um, I'm tempted just to, to, to have a, a, a couple more comments. I, I do want to give Jan, who sat and listened um, to everything that's gone on, an opportunity um, specifically to respond to this thing about uh, debate. Um, before I do that, though, I'm going to come back to, to Johnny because he made a, a really important point that I wish I'd had a chance to come back to earlier, which is, Johnny, you, you wrote in the chat that you did think there was a way Mm. to craft a fully inclusive uh, line, um, even given the sort of com conflict. And whether it's Stonewall or whether it's a different organisation actually sort of doesn't matter, but do you think it's possible to do this in one go, even in spite of the sort of conflicts of interest? Well, I, I don't think it's necessarily pos uh, possible to be completely inclusive because um, those people who want to pursue a gender identity theory orientated policy platform uh, over anything else wouldn't be happy with with a, a with a slightly more fudged compromise but i do think i mean yes stonewall was lgb for for 25 years but that doesn't mean that the t was excluded from from stonewall's thinking and from and from a lot of its activities the um it it was uh, it may not have campaigned specifically on trans issues, but but the T was part of Stonewall's vision through through those years, and part of the the. I mean, I, I've been looking through the old Stonewall website at at, at some of the the, the 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 trans resources and and, and advice on that. But the but the only way to have to have to have brought the the LGBT t together um, by being trans inclusive would be not to be. Try, trying to compel belief in gender identity theory. Not, I mean, the, the step that Stonewall took that um, that has not worked is by adding another line to the definition of transphobia. So the the first part of the definition of transphobia is a reproduction of their um, is, is a sort of ad adaptation of the definition of homophobia. Um, the, you know, the dislike or non acceptance of. of, of trans people, gay people. But Stonewall added a line to the definition of, of transphobia, saying including, um, I'm paraphrasing, unwillingness to accept or refusal to accept gender identity. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where Stonewall went wrong. It took a sort of uh, totalitarian step, saying that it's not just about um, uh, discrimination against trans people and, and trans people's civil rights, but you must believe in gender identity or you're transphobic or you hate trans people you're on a par with, with, with racists. And there was a way to be trans inclusive without taking that step into this sort of minor totalitarianism. And, and it's, I think it's a great shame that that, that wasn't considered, um, but that, but it wouldn't have pleased everyone. And, and many people would have, would have, would feel that it wasn't fully trans inclusive because for many, um, you know, uh, trans people, gender identity 
is everything. General identity theory is everything. And refusal to accept the principle, uh, to the, the, the concept of gender identity is, can be experienced as a deeply painful, um, a deeply painful thing. So there's no, there's no easy route through this, but that, that additional line to the definition of transphobia is where, is, is where, is the sort of yeah. original sin of this new, this mm -hmm. new stuff, where it all went wrong. And, um, and it's the essential thing that Stonewall needs to wind back, especially in the light of the Maya Fostata um, appeal judgment. Yeah, which, yeah, um, yeah. My, and Maya, I've spied, is, is in, in the chat and is in the oh, um, Thanks ever so much, um, Johnny. Okay, um, I'm gonna clap to, to um, Jan, who's sat patiently um, listening to everything that's gone on. Jan, we, we've only got obviously a few minutes left, we've massively run over. So thank you for sitting um, and, and, and listening. Um, I don't mean to sort of symbolically give you the last word and for people to read anything into that, but this particular thing, the particular um, uh, exacerbating, aggravating factor and the thing that makes people really feel, I'm talking about lesbians, gay men and bisexual people feel um, angry and frustrated is that the no we're not allowed to de debate it now i don't quite think what we've had this evening is a debate as such we've had people come on and say things and they don't agree with one another but what what would you say to to that the the the, the, the possibility of asking a question and not being fearful as a consequence of that well so 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 first of all thank you for everyone getting everything uh off their chest uh i i there's nothing like hearing it from the, the horse's mouth. There's a lot of things been attributed to Stonewall in the last half hour or so that are just simply not true. And so I won't just uh, use having the last word to rebut everything, but I do, I do resent the misrepresentation of Stonewall's position. I've even written and had published a letter in the Times that acknowledges the difference between sex, sexual orientation and gender. So this idea that, that Stonewall doesn't understand um, sex and has, you know, this, this use of sort of semi-academic terminology about gender critical theory and stuff, you know, it's ridiculous. The position that Stonewall has on, on debate, and I hope as I've demonstrated by being here, is dialogue is one thing, but we come from a position of acceptance. So the Equality Act is there to protect the fact that trans people exist, as do women, as do uh, lesbians and, and gay men and, and bisexual people. And so if you come at this discussion, which I think is what, what we have to have, a discussion and a dialogue about what does all this mean and how can we be inclusive, Stonewall's position is not no debate for the sake of it, we are in discussion all the time with many, many organizations. We've done nothing but grow uh, in the last few years. There is no question of Stonewall disappearing or going anywhere or being in crisis. Whether the, the lesbian and gay and bisexual people on this uh, call like it or not, we are still campaigning for them. We are still working for lesbians and gay and bisexual people. But if you want to be trans inclusive, you come at this whole topic from the position of how can we be trans inclusive? And unless you accept that, that trans women are deemed to be women and trans men are deemed to be men, which is a position of accepting their identity and who am I to question someone else's identity? I self ID as a lesbian. I don't expect someone to say, well, prove it to me. So Stonewall's position is accepting if people say that they're, they're trans, that they are. And therefore the questions from that point onward become, if we accept people for who they are, if we don't want people to feel ashamed, if we want people to be able to get on with their everyday lives in a dignified, in a dignified way, able to use the, the loo, able to work alongside people without insult, without being misgendered, the possibility of playing sport, for instance, how do you make places inclusive is where Stonewall is coming from. So in other words, trans people are here and as real and as deserving of our, our respect and acceptance as people who are lesbian and gay. And that's the very simple position that 
that Stonewall holds, which is how do we create inclusive spaces which include lesbians and gay and bisexual and trans people together with mutual respect, mutual dignity, and without attack. I've never, I have never uh, set out to insult anybody. I know we agree to disagree, and I know that people have very strong uh, feelings and, and beliefs about this, but I simply put to everybody that I believe the majority of sensible people in this country actually are perfectly comfortable to accept that trans people are real, they've been here as long as humanity have been here, and we have to find a way to allow them to live their lives with dignity and respect and without fear of violence and ridicule and discrimination, which is something that lesbians and gay and bisexual people as their kind of siblings in the queer uh, communities can completely relate to and understand. Okay, um, Jan, thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody. It's one minute past eight. I have won the record of the longest ever thinking, which was not my intention, but I nonetheless hold that title now. I want to say a sincere thank you um, to everybody who has joined in, been honest, been brave, I think. Um, and I never expected to get into this conversation and come out with a consensus. I hope what we have managed to do is at least um, keep it broadly civil. We've definitely disagreed, um, and we should try to uh, continue to productively talk about this, and maybe the next bucket of stuff in this space that we tackle is specifically around um, trans women in sport and that kind of thing, because there's there's more things to talk about in relation in relation to that. So I, I do want to sincerely thank everybody um, for uh, joining in and for bearing with me um, and for their generosity and focus and their articulate points. I sincerely hope that we can repeat this thinking in five years' time and look back and laugh. I wonder if we will be able to do that. But um, in the meanwhile everybody look after each other stay safe go and have a nice drink and hopefully some dinner and if you'd like to come to another thinking we're going again tomorrow matt Duncan is hosting should boris johnson declare a national education emergency um thank you very much everyone have a lovely evening bye bye